Today I'm going to talk about an unrecognised manuscript written by Francis Bacon, produced by the Bacon family scribe Petruccio Ubaldini. The model for Petruccio in The Taming of the Shrew, whose father in the play is Antonio, and where two of his household servants are named Nicholas and Nathaniel, the Christian names of Antony, Nicholas and Nathaniel Bacon. This video is dedicated to several members of the Theobald family, B.G. Theobald, R.M. Theobald and W. Theobald, for their enormous contribution to Baconian literature. We learn from those who were closest to Francis Bacon that they were privy to his secret life and writings from his concealed royal birth, of his Rosicrucian brotherhood and his authorship of the Shakespeare works. They knew that he was a child prodigy or genius and that he started writing and producing a variety of different works from a very early age. How do we know? Because they simply tell us. His private secretary and chaplain, who lived with Lord Bacon for the last ten years of his life, a member of his Rosicrucian Brotherhood, and his first editor and English biography, states that... His first and childish years were not without some mark of eminency, at which time he was endued with that pregnancy and towardness of wit, as they were presages of that deep and universal apprehension which was manifest in him afterward. The biographer David Lloyd, who knew members of Bacon's Rosicrucian Brotherhood and had access to private information about his secret life and writing, stated, at 12, his industry was above the capacity and his mind above the reach of his contemporaries. Let us just dwell for a moment on what Lloyd hints at. At 12, Lloyd says, Francis Bacon's industry was above the capacity and his extraordinary mind above the reach of his contemporaries. In other words, at 12 years old, this extraordinary prodigy, who, according to some, would become the greatest English philosopher of all time, and to others the greatest poet and playwright the world has ever seen, already had a mind beyond those of his contemporaries. Now let us also carefully consider the other half of this statement, namely that the industry of this incomparable genius was also above his contemporaries. It is clear that Lloyd is privy to the still concealed secret that Francis Bacon was prodigiously writing and producing works before he was 12 years old, none of which have ever officially yet emerged into the light of day. Today, I will reveal one of those writings for the first time. Through his incredible industry, Francis Bacon went on to produce a wide variety of writings, including legal, religious and political tracts, and a series of dramatic masks, devices and entertainments that were circulated in manuscript, often anonymously or in the, set in the name of others, which is succinctly confirmed by his modern editors, Stuart and Knight. These writings can be classified into four categories. First, texts that Bacon wrote but not for public consumption. Second, texts Bacon wrote to be circulated with his name. Third, texts Bacon intended to circulate anonymously. And fourth, texts that were intended to circulate under another's name. From the late 1560s through to the early 1570s and beyond, the Bacon family country estate at Gorhambury, headed by Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne Bacon, was a refuge and hotbed for radical Protestant and Puritan dissidents. This radical group included the Cambridge evangelical preacher Edward During, who on the 25th of January 1570 preached at court before the Queen, attacking the corrupt church hierarchy, holding her directly responsible and stating that, while that all these whoredoms are committed, you sit idly by and let happen. Needless to say, his personal tirade directed at Queen Elizabeth caused grievous offence and he was suspended from preaching. 
While Stirring was deeply unpopular with Queen Elizabeth, he enjoyed the support of a number of powerful patrons, such as Robert Dudley Earl of Leicester, as well as Henry Killigrew and his wife Catherine Cook Killigrew, along with the other Cook sisters, Lady Mildred Cook Cecil, Lady Elizabeth Cook Hobie and Lady Anne Cook Bacon. Stirring, still out in the royal cold through 1571 and 1572, Lady Bacon and her sisters Mildred, Elizabeth and Catherine set in motion a plan to restore Durring to favour with Elizabeth by offering as a present via its dedicatee her favourite Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, a scientific philosophical treatise written in Italian entitled The Cultivated Cosmographical Garden, attributed to one Bartolo Silva. Without any trumpet call or fanfare, this previously unknown manuscript hidden away in the vaults of the Cambridge University was first discovered by Professor Louise Schleiner some time prior to the publication of her Tudor and Stuart Women Writers by Indiana University Press, 1994. The still relatively unknown manuscript has not yet given up its true authorship or its hidden connection to Bacon's Shakespeare play, The Taming of the Shrew. The manuscript is prefaced by a four-page dedication written in Italian addressed to Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, signed by Dr Bartolo Silva. It includes prefatory poems in Greek, Latin and other languages by Döring himself, his wife, the translator and rel religious activist Anne Vaughan Locke Döring, and the four Cook sisters, Mildred, Elizabeth, Catherine and Lady Anne Bacon, who all insist Döring was responsible for co converting Dr Bartolo Silva to the Protestant faith. This was all part of the ploy to rehabilitate and restore Döring back to royal favour. The two Greek poems by Döring, one addressed to Dr Bartolo Silva and the other on himself, both play on the closeness between the Latin word silva, meaning wood or forest, and Bartolo's surname silva. The manuscript, written in a fine italic hand with striking illustrations, is the work of a scribe who signs himself D. M. Petruccio, a Florentine. In their verses, Anne Döring and sisters Mildred, Catherine and Anne extensively play on the silver metaphor, with specific mention of the forest, the woods, woodland and the garden. The Latin verse by Lady Anne Cook Bacon highlights the very title of the work, The Cultivated Cosmographical Garden, pointing to the vastness of its philosophical scientific ambition incorporated in the microcosm of man and macrocosm of the universe. By the title this book declares itself, its wealth of aid stored up it shows, on its own name relying. It offers the world, offers the stars, but what man will not such names themselves enrapture? Heaven does not shudder at darkness, nor earth at thorns, for each perce perceives the crafting hand. What first was a sylvan wood is a more amenable garden, so whoever you are, you may stroll off your path into roses. The manuscript is itself a curious and remarkable mixture of ancient philosophical wisdom and the emerging science surrounding man and his place in the universe, the microcosm and macrocosm. The philosophy of the Rosicrucians, founded according to the German Rosicrucian Michael Mayer in 1571, about the time of this manuscript. It contains complex diagrams and cosmographical illustrations tracing the journey of dark chaos to universal harmony. Ideas explored in the first Rosicrucian pamphlet, The Universal Reformation of the Whole World, to be achieved through philosophy and science for the future benefit of humankind. It was around this time or just shortly after, during Bacon's residence at Cambridge, commencing from 1573, his biographer Spedding enigmatically reveals that the idea of a universal reformation and the future fortunes of the human race occurred to the young Francis Bacon. It was then that a thought struck him, the date of which deserves to be recorded. 
If our study of nature be thus barren, he thought, our method of study must be wrong. Might not a better method be found? The suggestion was simple and obvious. The singularity was in the way it took hold of him. With most men, such a thought would have come and gone in a passing regret. A few might have matured it into a wish, some into a vague project. One or two might perhaps have followed it out so far as to attain a distinct conception of the better method, and hazard a, dis a distant indication of the direction in which it lay. But in him, the gift of seeing in prophetic vision what might be and ought to be was united with the practical talent of devising means and handling minute details. He could at once imagine like a poet and execute like a clerk of the works. I believe it ought to be regarded as the most important event of his life, the event which had a greater influence than any other upon his character and future course. From that moment there was awakened within his breast the appetite which cannot be sated and the passion which cannot commit excess. From that moment he had a vague vocation which employed and stimulated all the energies of, of his mind, an object to live for as wide as humanity, as immortal as the human race, an idea to live in vast and lofty enough to fill the soul forever with religious and heroic aspirations. Assuming then that a deep interest in these three great causes, the cause of reformed religion of his native country, of the human race through all their generations, was thus early implanted in that vigorous and virgin soil of his young prodigious mind. The Cambridge manuscript also presents recent discoveries of the New Worlds, Peruvian Cusco, Aztec Timistian, the Straits of Magellan, the Caribbean, Canada, Florida and South America, as well as other parts of the world, impressively described in some detail by Professor Schleiner. The manuscript has strikingly well executed colour illustrations, for example chaos with swirling interweaving storm shapes in various colours shading into each other and of two new world cities, Peruvian Cusco and Aztec Temestian, the latter shown spread around its pale lake full of islands, with fiery volcanoes lining the southern shore. On geography, it is up to date. The Straits of Magellan and the discoveries of Menendez's 1566 voyage are included. It notes the French colonies in Canada and Florida, the Spanish ones around the Caribbean and South America upon the Bay of Baja, California, and the island of Japan bounding the Pacific Ocean. A colour diagram shows the global lines of latitude and longitude. Yet around this up-to-date earth, in another chart in gold ink and elegant subdued colours, glitters an armillary sphere of the Ptolemaic universe with all eleven heavens out to the prima mobile, the habitation of God and the most elevated angels. Chapters on what we would call chemistry and biology taxonomise the things of the sublunary world consisting of earth, air, fire and water, and many poems or excerpts of verse on natural philosophy by Petrarch, Alciato, Ariosto and others are included. From an early age, the idea and vision of new worlds fascinated the mind of the young Francis Bacon, and he took a deep and prolonged interest in all human discovery and knowledge of the world and the cosmos. Bacon, with his Rosicrucian Brotherhood, was responsible for establishing the first permanent English settlement in North America, in Jamestown, Virginia, which eventually evolved into the United States of America. His utopia, New Atlantis, land of the Rosicrucians, which was a blueprint and set out his vision for the United States of America, first saw the light of day appended to his natural history, the Silver Silverum. Silver means wood or forest, and Silver Silverum a collection of materials for building the new science, the very running theme of the manuscript book, The Cultivated Cosmographical Garden. In her book, Tudor and Stuart Women Writers, published in 1994, which publicly made known for the first time the existence of the Cambridge manuscript entitled Cultivated Cosmographical Garden, Professor Schleiner knew nothing about its supposed author, Dr. Bartolo Silva. She states that, 
Reference works on 16th century Italian doctors and Italian Protestants do not show any information about Dr. Bartolo Silva of Turin. Presumably an obscure young man when he left home to serve as a surgeon in the Low Countries. It apparently did not occur to Professor Schleiner to question the authorship of Dr. Bartolo Silva, a doctor of medicine, of the manuscript Cultivated Cosmographical Garden, a manuscript self-evidently written by someone with a profound and wide interest in ancient and modern philosophy and the various branches of the science, as well as ancient and Renaissance poets. Following Professor Schleiner, the Cambridge manuscript has been examined and discussed by Dr Chris Latouris in his full-length work on Lady Elizabeth Cook-Russell, entitled Shakespeare and the Countess, Professor Philippi in another full-length work on Lady Russell, entitled The Writings of an English Sappho, and Dr Gemma Allen in the first published full-length work entitled The Cook Sisters. Like Professor Schleiner, none of these authoritative scholars has ever once questioned the authorship of Dr Bartolo Silva, even though in the fullness of his lifetime, in both Italy and in England, he is not known to have written any other published or unpublished work on any subject whatsoever. The dates of publication of the recent works by Dr. Allen, Professor Philippi and Dr. Latouris are of some importance on account that they are all post-2003. This is the date when vital information about Bartolo Silva was made known for a first time by Margaret Pelling and Francis White in Medical Conflicts in Early Modern London, published by Oxford Clarendon Press in 2003, further augmented by Pelling and White in Physicians and Irregular Practitioners Database, originally published by the Centre for Metropolitan History, London, in 2004. These publications made available excerpts from the annals of the Royal College of Physicians relating to Dr. Bartolo Silva, a physician patronised by Bacon's uncle, Sir William Cecil, Lord Burley, and the favourite Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. The first entry states, Dr. Bartolo Silva, an Italian from Turin, whose period of medical practice was from 1550 to 1581, was reprimanded 1560, accused 1569-1571, fined and imprisoned, nasty. In 1576, Silva was residing in the Vintry Ward of the parish of St. John the Baptist upon Walbrook in London. He was summoned to a censorial hearing, 23rd of September, 1570. Bartolo Silva, an Italian of Turin, appeared on the charge of malpractice. Firstly, as Dr Ludford confirmed in his presence, he had procured an abortion. Secondly, he had undertaken the treatment of a certain old woman by fumigation, from which she died. These incidents seem to the President and the Censors too important to be passed over in silence, but no decision was reached because it was necessary to go the next morning to the Earl of Bedford in connection with the settlement of matters arising from the business with surgeons. Therefore, he was sent away until 20 days after Michaelmas. He made a further appearance before the Fellows of the Royal College of Physicians on the 10th of January 1571, who, after examining Dr. Bartolo Silva, the supposed author of the philosophical scientific treatise Cultivated Cosmographical Garden, declared him ignorant of medicine and philosophy. Bartolo Silva, an Italian, was examined and rejected by the agreement of all the fellows because he was as ignorant of medicine as of philosophy. He was also fined £20 because he had practised medicine for six months with great danger to the state. Following his examination by the fellows, he was rejected, prohibited and fined £20 for his previous practice and rejected as a college member. The next entry for 21st of December 1571 reports, Bartolo Silva was put into prison because he continued to practice medicine. He was released by the intervention of Lord Burley and the, the Earl of Leicester, and when offered a further examination, did not wish to accept, 
nor when asked did he know how to reach Sparta, mentioned in his letter of application. For this reason he was rejected, and also because his behaviour was impudent, quarrelsome and noisy, lacking consideration and respect. On these grounds, therefore, the majority considered that he should be committed to the fleet prison. He was, however, dismissed, his fine to the officer of the fleet being assessed at six shillings, eight pence, and to the beadle at twenty pence, and with the instruction to come to the President's house near St Bartholomew the Less in Smithfield on the Sunday after Christmas. The final entry we have is dated 30th of December 1571, with the instruction to come to the President's house near St Bartholomew the Less in Smithfield on the Sunday after Christmas to see whether the college would give him a fine or imprisonment. But when, according to instruction, he came, it was announced that he might depart to await a further summons. The time and other circumstances of the matter dictated this course of action. This information fatally collapses the transparent fiction that Dr. Bartolo Silva was the author of the philosophical scientific treatise Cultivated Cosmographical Garden, which was written by Francis Bacon when he was in his twelfth year, the age his near contemporary biographer David Lloyd, who was clearly privy to the secret life and writings of Bacon, said about him, his industry was above the capacity and his mind above the reach of his contemporaries. The way the manuscript book, The Cultivated Cosmographical Garden, is set out with its dedication to Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, its address to the reader, followed by an anonymous verse, all of them written by its true author concealed behind the mask of Dr. Bartolo Silva, and other prefatory verses from the Cook sisters, suggest it was originally intended for publication. Initially, the original plan may have been to publish the work sometime in the first half of 1572. For some reason, in the end, it was not published, and there is no evidence confirming its dedicatee and intended recipient, the Earl of Leicester, actually ever received the manuscript, and similarly, there is no evidence it was ever seen or read by Queen Elizabeth. Nor was Durring restored to royal favour in the period leading up to his death, which occurred some years later in June 1576. It would be another four centuries before the manuscript book entitled The Cultivated Cosmographical Garden was discovered by Professor Schleiner down in the vaults of Cambridge University sometime during the 1990s, and more than two decades into the new millennium, but before we found ourselves in a position to consider and comprehend that it was written by its favourite son, Francis Bacon. Of all the Cook sister scholars who examined the cultivated cosmographical garden, Dr. Allen is the only one to name the scribe responsible for the manuscript, but for some reason she also does not attempt to identify him. The florid signature of the scribe, D. M. Petruccio, a Florentine, is found at the end of the manuscript. The reluctance by the likes of Dr. Lataris of Shakespeare Institute and Dr. Allen of Oxford University to attempt to identify the scribe is all the more curious because one does not have to look too hard to discover it. In a similar manner, the name and biographical details about our scribe can scarcely be found in works of other orthodox Shakespeare editors and scholars, for reasons which will soon become obvious, regarding this historical figure and calligraphist who is here placed in a Baconian Shakespearean context for the very first time. The full name of the calligraphist and illuminator of the cultivated cosmographical garden, produced in fine Italian script and beautifully illustrated, is Petruccio Ubaldini, who spent much of his later life at the Elizabethan court. His relationship with the Bacon family covered a period of five decades. In 1550, he dedicated a manuscript now in the British Library entitled Una Libra Semplare Scrito Lano to Nicholas Bacon, this being the first recorded instance of the, his relationship with Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne Bacon, and thereafter with their son Francis, which continued until his death 50 years later, around 1600.
After spending more than a decade in Venice and Italy, on his return to London in 1562, Ubaldini soon found a patron in Henry Fitzalan, the 12th Earl of Arundel, who presented him to the Elizabethan court, where he attracted the attention of other patrons, including Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne Bacon, herself a fine Italian scholar who had translated from the Italian Bernardino Ocino's sermons and was an active supporter of the Italian community in London. Initially, Ubaldini taught Italian and Sir Nicholas Bacon may well have employed him to assist Lady Bacon in her efforts to teach Francis Italian in the late 1560s, in the years leading up to the production of the cultivated cosmographical garden, for which, on behalf of Francis, Lady Bacon commissioned Ubaldini to copy it out in fine Italic script through the latter part of 1571 and the early months of 1572. Around the period that Ubaldini was likely residing with the Bacon family at Gorenbury in York House, he participated in an anonymous mask, which one wonders might have been written by a young Francis who later wrote masks during the Elizabethan and Jacobean reigns. The mask was performed before Queen Elizabeth at court on the 15th of June 1572, for which a castle was built for Lady Peace with a rock and fountain for Apollo and the Nine Muses. Not long after the mask was performed at court, sometime in the second half of 1572 and before October 1574, Sir Nicholas Bacon was in the process of constructing the long gallery at Gorenbury, closely watched by his son Francis, wherein he had depicted on its panels the sententia of Seneca and Cicero. On a visit to Gorenbury, the strikingly visual sententiae caught the attention and was much admired by Jane, nay Fitzalan, Lady Lumley, eldest child of Henry Fitzalan, 12th Earl of Arundel. In late 1575 or early 1576, Sir Nicholas Bacon commissioned Petruccio Ubaldini to produce an illuminated manuscript of the classical inscriptions on the wall of the Long Gallery, as a present for Lady Lumley, now held at the British Library, beautifully illustrated on expensive vellum. During the same period Ubaldini was working for Sir Nicholas Bacon producing this illuminated manuscript, on the 27th of February 1576, a play was performed at court that may have been the one referred to as Commedia Italiana in an undated letter written by Ubaldini in Italian to Elizabeth. The patronage of Petruccio Ubaldini by Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne Bacon during the previous decades was naturally inherited by Francis from the 1580s, during which time Ubaldini also benefit, benefited from another powerful patron, Bacon's uncle Sir William Cecil. It was almost certain through the agency of Cecil and Bacon that from 1581 Ubaldini began working closely with the printer and publisher John Wolfe as a translator and consultant. And for the next decade, Ubaldini worked with Wolf on several important clandestine Italian works, including those by Pietro Aretino and the notorious political philosopher Niccolò Machiavelli, published with false imprints and fictitious places of publication, for which Bacon wrote the Italian prefaces. In the midst of the last of the Italian Machiavelli editions proofread by Ubaldini and printed by Wolf, Bacon directed Wolf to pr print the trilingual edition of the Courtier in 1588, which formats in parallel columns Castiglione's original Italian, the French translation of Chapuis and the English translation by his uncle, Sir Thomas Hobie, assisted by his wife, Lady Elizabeth Cook Hobie, younger sister of Lady Anne Bacon. Above the first page of this trilingual text stands Bacon's enigmatic AA headpiece. The courtier was drawn upon by Bacon for many of his Shakespeare plays, including The Taming of the Shrew, written around 1590, co-starring an Italian man with the name Petruccio, the same Christian name of Petruccio Ubaldini, and Catherine, the same Christian name of Bacon's aunt, Catherine Cook Killigrew, younger sister of Lady Anne Bacon.
The precise dating of the Taming of the Shrew is complicated by the existence of the anonymous play with the title The Taming of a Shrew. The exact relationship between the two plays is still hotly disputed, with the main theories advocated by Shakespeare scholars given here below. A Shrew is the original play and a direct source for The Shrew. The Shrew was written first and an A Shrew is an anonymous imitation. The Shrew is the original play and A Shrew is a memorial reconstruction by one or more actors, i.e. a so-called bad quarter. Both Shrews derive independently from an earlier play, now lost. Both Shrews derive from a lost original which was Shakespeare's first version of the play. Shakespeare wrote both The Taming of A Shrew and The Taming of The Shrew. It has also been noted by some Shakespeare scholars that the difference between the titles could be no more significant than the fact the Winter's Tale is often referred to as a Winter's Tale or the Comedy of Errors as a Comedy of Errors. The publishers of the Shakespeare First Folio regarded A Shrew as a previously published version of The Shrew and thus did not include the latter in their entries of previously unpublished plays. It is now widely assumed by modern Shakespeare scholars that a version of the play was written around 1589 to 90, with some scholars suggesting an even earlier date, and others opting for a range of dates from 1589 to 1594. The play was entered on the Stationers' Register in May 1594, and anonymously published thereafter as A Pleasant Conceited History Called The Taming of a Shrew as it was sundry times acted by the Right Honourable the Earl of Pembroke, his servants. Only one copy of this 1594 edition survives, which is now held in the Huntington Library, California. Both the anonymous The Taming of A Shrew and The Taming of The Shrew, first printed in the first folio, were written by Shakespeare, i.e. Bacon. In his Advancement of Learning, Bacon set out a series of the cipher systems which he later incorporated into his acknowledged writings and the quarto and folio editions of his Shakespeare plays. The simple cipher referred to by Bacon is a substitution cipher based upon the 24-letter Elizabethan alphabet. I and J and U and V were interchangeable in which each letter is given a numerical value. The title page of a pleasant conceited history called The Taming of a Shrew contains a number of Baconian Rosicrucian ciphers. The top section contains 10 words and 49 letters. 49 minus 10 equals 39, F Bacon in simple cipher. The 14 italic words found in the middle and bottom section, plus the addition of the date, 1 plus 5 plus 9 plus 4, 14 plus 19 equals 33, Bacon in simple cipher. In the bottom section there are 84 letters, which when added to the addition of the date, 84 plus 19 equals 103, Shakespeare in simple cipher. The whole page contains a total of 33 Roman words, Bacon in simple cipher, and 204 letters which minus a single woodcut, 204 minus 1 equals 203. A double simple cipher for Francis Bacon 100, Shakespeare 103. The 47 words, 204 letters and the six words around the emblem in the woodcut, 47 plus 204 plus plus six equals 257, a double simple cipher for Francis Bacon, 100, for our Rosie Cross, 157. Among the most notable changes in the two different versions of the play is that, aside from Christopher Sly and Catherine, all the other names found in the earlier version are changed in the revised version printed for the first time in the Shakespeare First Folio. This included changing the name of its central character, who in the earlier version of the play was named Ferrando, to Petruchio in the fo folio version, the name known to scholars, students and theatre-goers around the world.
As all Shakespeare scholars know, the names of the characters in the Shakespeare plays are often of great significance significance and importance and that the name he gives them can be clues pointing to historical and contemporary real-life models. The subject of names in the Shakespeare plays are of such importance that the whole books have been written on the theme and its variants included encyclopedias and dictionaries and simply countless works that give over a great deal of space attempting to identify the real-life person behind a Shakespeare name and character. These standard works invariably have entries for the character of Petruchio in The Taming of the Shrew, in which not one of them makes any mention of Petruchio Ubaldini as a possible real-life model. This is also the case in orthodox biographies of Shakespeare, anthologies discussing the Shakespeare plays, and nor does the name of Petruchio Ubaldini appear in any of the indices of standard editions of The Taming of the Shrew. Let us then start with a small clue for the orthodox Shakespeare schoolman regarding the contemporary model for Petruchio in The Taming of the Shrew that requires not even a scintilla of academic prowess, intellectual subtlety or sophistication. Petruchio and Petruchio Baldini share the same name. And moreover, to remove any reasonable uncertainty as to the possibility of any other contemporary candidates, we can do no better than quote the words of the editor, Professor Barbara Hodgson, of the modern Bloomsbury Arden edition of The Taming of the Shrew, in which the name of Petruchio Ubaldini does not appear in its detailed 13-page index. Petruchio. There was one prominent Petruchio in London, Petruchio Ubaldini, two of whose works are plausibly associated with Edward III. For reasons best known to herself, Professor Hodgson, in this 448-page edition of The Taming of the Shrew, the gold standard Bible edition of the play, did not apparently deem it appropriate to provide her learned readership with a comprehensive summary of the life and works of Petruchio Ubaldini and any possible links to Shakespeare the man and poet. Understandably, even though there is an entry for him in the DMB and the ODMB, the name of Petruchio Baldini remains virtually unknown to the non-specialist scholar or casual student, but he has for centuries been known to Elizabethan historians and at least some Shakespeare editors, critics and commentators. So why the avoiding of any discussion of the contemporary figure Petruchio Baldini in relation to the central protagonist Petruchio in The Taming of the Shrew? Is it in some instances simple plain ignorance or in others deliberate systematic suppression? What can be said with some confidence is that when all the relevant information about Petruchio Baldini and his links and relationships with the Bacons, and in particular Francis Bacon, is presented in a single narrative, as it is here for the first time, it illuminates the true authorship of the Shakespeare play The Taming of the Shrew, which is reinforced and confirmed by other evidence presented in this video. In addition to the principal plot of The Taming of the Shrew, in which the shrewish Catherine is wooed, won and tamed by Petruchio, there is an interconnected subplot involving Lucentio, Gremio and Hortensio as rival suitors for the hand of Catherine's sister named Bianca. The character of Catherine in the play shares the same Christian name with Catherine Cook Killigrew. In real life, Catherine Cook Killigrew was the younger sister of Lady Anne Cook Bacon, and in the play the sister of Catherine is named Bianca. The name of Bianca may well have been adopted by Bacon for the purposes of an anagram, as it yields I Bacon, which is of course a near anagram of I Bacon, or alternatively Anne Back, a near anagram or a contraction, suggesting the name Anne Bacon. In The Taming of the Shrew, Bacon provides the character of Petruchio with a father, whom he makes Petruchio refer to on three separate occasions. Our author can of course select any name he chooses from literally hundreds of different names. From this vast range of possibilities, Bacon chooses the name Antonio, the Italian form of Antony, the name of his beloved brother, Antony Bacon. Signor Hortensio, thus it stands with me. Antonio, my father, is deceased. 
Born in Verona, old Antonio's son. Petruccio is my name, Antonio's son. There has also been a very curious pattern in the way the Dramatis Personae of the Taming of the Shrew has been presented down the centuries in both complete editions of the Shakespeare works and in single editions of the play. To illustrate this repeated practice, I here below provide a number of representative examples covering a period of the last 200 years, carried over from the first editions of the Shakespeare plays. To begin with, when printing the customary list of Dramatis Personae before the Taming of the Shrew, in the almost endless editions of the complete works, the household servants of Petruccio are not named. Then there was an almost imperceptible seismic development when the ardent editors of The Taming of the Shrew named Curtis as Petruccio's chief or personal servant and, it will be observed, they also state that Petruccio has five other servants. Then, as we were approaching the new millennium, matters took another very curious turn. In the most widely read modern edition of the complete works of Shakespeare, its editors, Professor Stanley Wells, honorary president of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, widely billed as the world's most foremost expert on Shakespeare, and his co-editor, Professor Gary Taylor, actually put names to Petruccio's servants. Yet remarkably, in only naming these four servants, they very deliberately omitted the name of another. One, when placed alongside one of those they did name, has enormous significance. A modus operandi they repeated in the second edition of the Complete Works of Shakespeare, published by arguably the most prestigious press in the world, the Oxford Clarendon. It may have been worthwhile for our two trusted illustrious editors of the most widely printed and available modern edition of the complete works of Shakespeare to have consulted the characters of the play in the Oxford edition of The Taming of the Shrew, of which Professor Stanley Wells acted as general editor, in which the name of the other servant is printed. Finally, nearly 400 years after the publication of The Taming of the Shrew in the first folio, the names of these servants were named by Oxford editor Oliver and likewise by Professors Bate and Rasmussen in the complete edition of the works for the RSC and Professor Hodgson in the latest Arden edition of The Taming of the Shrew. For some very curious reason, it would take orthodox Shakespeare authorities nearly four centuries to print together the names of the servants Nathaniel and Nicholas. Following the wedding of Petruccio and Catherine, we meet these servants in Act 4, Scene 1 at Petruccio's country house. His servant Grumio arrives at Petruccio's house complaining how cold it is and prepares to light a fire as they and the other servants prepare for the arrival of their master and their new mistress. Grumio instructs Curtis to make sure that the servants all look smart and are correctly adorned in their uniforms. When the newly wedded couple arrive, Petruccio is angry his servants are not outside to meet him and immediately begins to insult and abuse them. He orders his servants to bring him supper and continues to act rudely and aggressively. He kicks one of the servants and rails at the other, other as he continues to verbally and physically abuse those around him, among them Nathaniel and Nicholas. By this reckoning, he is more shrew than she. Aye, and that thou and the proudest of you all shall find when he comes home. But what talk I of this? Call forth Nathaniel, Joseph, Nicholas, Philip, Walter, Sugarsop, and the rest. Here we have in this scene a very special gathering of characters. The swaggering and ludicrous Petruccio, modelled on the calligrapher and scribe Petruccio Albedini, who was commissioned by Sir Nicholas Bacon to produce the illustrated manuscript of the Sententiae on the gallery walls at Gorhambury, 
and commissioned by Lady Bacon to copy out in fine Italian script the cultivated cosmographical garden, composed by a young Francis, prefaced by Greek and Latin verses from herself and her sister Catherine, refracted through the character of Catherine in The Taming of the Shrew. In a play where Catherine also has a sister named Bianca, from which we are able to anagrammatically de derive Anne Back, a contraction of Anne Bacon. The Christian name of her son, Anthony Bacon, is used in the play for Petruchio's father. And if all this was not enough, two of Petruchio's servants are named Nicholas and Nathaniel. The Christian names of Bacon's elder half-brother, Sir Nicholas and Sir Nathaniel Bacon, whose elite social standing as part of the landed gentry is brilliantly subverted by our supreme poet, presenting and portraying them as being from the lower classes, as lowly ber berated servants, serving their master Petruchio at his country house. The radically altered version of the play, revised and amended for the publication of the first folio, when virtually all those persons alluded to in the play were dead, with the exception of the ill and dying Sir Nicholas Bacon, who died in 1624, was in part a hilarious practical family joke by a philosopher poet who could never pass by a jest. Lampoon in the Bacon family scribe Petruchio Baldini and his real or imagined designs on Catherine Killigrew, with the part of Bianca modelled on her sister Lady Anne Bacon, and Petruchio's father given the name of Antonio after Anthony Bacon, two of whose servants had the same Christian names as his elder half-brothers Nicholas and Nathaniel Bacon. In the final analysis, The Taming of the Shrew is a Bacon family affair, written by the supreme family poet Francis Bacon. Thank you for listening and for more information, please see the next slide.